Hi. Uh, Cliff demanded that I not give an introduction, so there is no introduction. Of course, obviously, Cliff needs no introduction other than uh, let's welcome him to uh, today's event. Well, it's wonderful to be with you uh, in every way. I'm delighted to be here. I've had a hell of a three and a half year experience studying in Northern Thurman Colleges, and it's been one of the most inspiring experiences of my life, and uh, I'm delighted to report that I'm still learning, <laughs> and learning a great deal from MSI. So, by way of introduction, I'd just like to uh, welcome you to uh, what I hope is a discussion uh, to explore some ideas for educating a diverse nation. I put up the slide by my good buddy. Walter Allen from UCLA, with whom I've been working for many, many years on civil rights cases. And I think Walter is almost poetic here. Um, the, uh, before beginning the event, I would like to express my appreciation to several people, not least of all Mary Beth Gassman, who's a professor at the University of Pennsylvania, my colleague, friend, and uh, Todd Lundberg, who is a student here and actually got a second PhD in Kelpa a year ago, is now a dean at Cascadia Community College, was a great addition to the study, and uh, my wonderful wife, Julia, who contributed, as many of you would know, in myriad ways to this study. Uh, uh, more particularly, I'd like to thank uh, WCER, Bob Matthew, and everyone for their support uh, of this event. Uh, Joshua Justin at the Multicultural Student Center uh, was very supportive. I, uh, I'd particularly like to thank several people, two people, Catherine Weiland. Catherine, will you stand up? She's at African Studies and did a terrific job in helping getting this event. And that takes a hell of a lot of work to get these events going. And of course, Jim Delahunty from African Studies. Jim. And uh, along with uh, they, they, of course, there are so many other people that I would uh, like to uh, thank. Um, the uh, Westgate people, I can't begin to thank uh, Jason Lee, who is, uh, <laughs> my grandson just arrived, and uh, <laughs> it's career, career day for young people in schools, and uh, Karen and Julia are here. The uh, Westgate people have been incredibly helpful, particularly Jason Lee, and Noel and uh, of course, uh, Kimmy, uh, as well. Um, with respect to our get-together here today, I'd like to, uh, and I hope I can do this, uh, but I think I can, speak for no more than about 28 minutes and 34 seconds, <laughs> so that we can have a dialogue and begin to talk about this challenge, because it's clearly a formidable challenge. It's not one that we need to read Walter Allen's quote, though it may remind us of the challenge we're facing. So then beyond that, I'd like to have a conversation that's just about me. It's about the work. It's our and your conversation about what we can do at this university and other universities in the area and colleges, uh, two-year colleges, technical colleges, and so on, to uh, educate, uplift a very, very diverse America. Um, I would like to ask one question, if you'll give me at the very beginning to get a sense. I don't want to make assumptions about people's background. How many people here have been to a uh, tribal college? At least two tribal colleges. <coughs> How many people have been to at least two historically black colleges in the How many have been to 40 or 50? Uh, <laughs> 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 How many have been to Hispanic serving institutions? Two at least. <coughs> and uh, Native American, Native American Pacific Islander institutions? At least two. Oh, okay. Gives me a little context, and uh, here we go. I'm going to do a little portraiture at the very beginning. Again, you see Walter's quote. I'm not going to read those so much on the screen very much because I've been to a lot of PowerPoints, and all of you can read. So I want to begin just by saying a little bit about some of the challenges <coughs> and drawing out a study even before turning to it. Namely, that uh, in doing this study, I think I became, notwithstanding having been around historically black colleges for 35 years and uh, trauma colleges. Really the, the myriad challenges that students 
are facing. It's not just money. I think a lot of people think it's just money. It's not just money. You can see some of those that are identified, that, I mean, up, identified up here. Uh, familial challenges, um, major family responsibilities. They go on and on. Poor nutrition, inadequate housing, on and on and on. Secondary trauma and so on. Um, and particularly when they go to certain colleges, some of them, for example, as in some cultures, <coughs> including tribal colleges, are used to listening and not standing up and asserting themselves. And we heard lots of stories about that. I remember some of the challenges very vividly when people would talk about some Asian American Pacific Islander institutions, for example, who talked about what it was like to be a perpetual foreigner on campus. I'll never forget some of those interviews. And students who said, uh, people made assumptions about where they're from, and they said, I'm Hmong, I'm Laotian, I'm Vietnamese, and on and on and on. So I think and, uh, some of the names these students have been called at other institutions, I'll try not to mention them today, but they can be quite disturbing. So in many ways, it was a really opening up for me, uh, and I think all of us need to think about the intersection of challenges. And I think that subsequently leads to thinking about we need to seriously question the one-size-fits-all model that we use often in our nation's college and universities. The diversity is almost well <coughs> the, uh Here's the overarching challenge. I think the way MSI is pregnant, you get it. It's not that people aren't capable. They haven't had the opportunity. But some of the rest of us have. To be legacy admissions or whatever the case was, in my case. Changing demographics of this country. You all have a sense of that. We're well on our way to becoming a plurality nation. Immigration, disproportionate growth of certain groups, and so on. The U.S. population is, uh, as we all know, here, growing, changing very rapidly, not least by race. Uh, over the last 30, 30 uh, rather, from 1980 to 2010, dramatic changes. Hispanic population is growing very, very rapidly. So next slide will indicate. And then we look at colleges and universities <coughs> that grown fivefold for Hispanic enrollment. You know, and this is over 31 years. Asian, American, Asian and Pacific Islander enrollment, black enrollment. American Indian Navy enrollment. Most of you have a pretty good sense of this, I suspect. So I'm just going to do, get right to the heart of the overarching challenge. I think it's stated here fairly succinctly. Maybe a bit overstated, a little bit sardonic, but let's, I think we need to get real. We haven't always provided equal educational opportunity for students across differing, not only racial, but cultural, ethnic, and uh, socioeconomic backgrounds. Now the question is, I'll get back to this a little bit later, is, uh, is this an unsettling <coughs> problem? <coughs> I frame the question this way, will, provide, will providing educational opportunities for diverse students uh, disrupt mainstream cultures? Our world, where we live in. I think we need to address that question all the way from the campus level, system level, to every course how we teach, what we do outside the classroom, and so on. MSIs have a very unique niche <coughs> in higher education, and as you probably know, lots of low-income students and students of color, as well as uh, have a lot of diverse faculty, I'll refer to briefly. Many of the students simply haven't had the opportunities, as earlier indicated, that other students uh, have had. They come often come from uh, <coughs> Backgrounds where they didn't have the opportunity to, to uh, was that many times learn English as a second language. We'll talk about some of those as well. But uh, uh, MSIs are doing, I just wanted to give a little, how many people here have been to the Marshall Islands? Hello? Oh, okay. <laughs> so we looked at the College of Marshall Islands. I'll never forget, I said they're a week. What if what is down west in Hawaii? Yeah. Well, <laughs> this is how when I got there. Faculty, staff, and students. That's what I came up to when I arrived on the Majora Atoll. 
and it scared the hell out of me because it's only about 50 yards wide. I got down on the airplane. I was greeted, taken to the Iraq campus. And what a beautiful, welcoming kind of place. I've never felt so at home. And I felt that way for an entire week. I like the phrase, we work hard. They do. <laughs> uh, trust me. <clears throat> MSI, um, a little bit about them, fairly distinctive. These are the more, four major types of what I refer to them as they're up there. Uh, to be an HSI, you have to be 25% undergrad uh, Hispanic. Uh, these HSIs are growing rapidly. More and more <laughs> our institutions are becoming HSIs, even if they don't self-identify all the time as HSIs. Uh, tribal colleges and universities, HSIs uh, mission, uh, Asian American, Native American, you have to have 10% low income undergraduate enrollment, Asian American Native, uh, Asian American, Native American, Pacific College, or be one. HBCUs and tribal colleges are designated by federal law, and uh, HSIs and NPCs qualify for federal programs. Here's a map, probably not very surprising. See the HBCUs are over here, most of them are in the south, uh, Atlanta, up there in Virginia, places I go a lot. And then we see the uh, HSIs, about 311, down in Texas, over to California. That's changing, it's going to be changing, but that's where it looks now. Tribal colleges up in the uh, upper Midwest. Uh, MSIs, we have two, as you probably know, uh, over to Montana, and, uh, and the AAPIs out west again. And uh, that's the overarching. I'll just say a little bit about students and faculty. <clears throat> Sometimes people don't appreciate how many uh, students are being served at these institutions. 10% of American Indian undergrads are at TCOs. 50% of Hispanic students are at HSIs. HBCUs, 11% of black undergraduates. And APZs, 25% of AAPIs graduates. The, uh, whoops, skipped a little fast there, the Pell Grants, you probably know the algorithm, except for uh, <coughs> a and APZs, uh, the other have pretty high percentages of uh, Pell Grants, HSIs are actually 48%. Uh, a little bit about retention rates, you can see them. Are there differences? Yeah. What's the difference? MSIs have formidable challenges. Many of their students come to college not only with uh, academic challenges, but they a lot of other challenges that I will refer to briefly later. Uh, mostly what I want to do is we did this little study and uh, visited 12 MSIs over three years. And it was quite an experience. I refer to the Marshall Islands. But uh, we took site visits to 12 minority serving institutions over three years and uh, spent two to three days with the exception of that glorious visit I had to we to the Marshall Islands. It was quite a quite a journey and uh, we interviewed, talked to everybody we could and uh, did a lot of walking around, a lot of participant observation, just looking, observing, young men in peer led team learning for example, all sorts of classes. Uh, pretty intense, 14, 16 hour days. And uh, we did a lot of interviews. In fact, uh, for some of you who are methodologically inclined, I brought along my, this is how I analyze data. I'm going to analyze data differently. If you really want to know what the hell is happening, you take cliff notes. That's what you do. <laughs> and you listen to people, and then you talk to them tomorrow and say, does this make sense? And finally, when they say, Cliff, you and Mary Beth are starting to make sense, then you're starting to feel like a little bit better about what you are finding with others. The MSI models a success study, how about some good funding, and uh, over this period, <clears throat> we actually had almost 200 applicants for these to be involved in this study, and uh, we narrowed it down to 12, pretty hard work. And, uh, but we did it. And the burning question was very straightforward. What do these institutions do with respect to programs, 
and practices that are cultivating student learning as well as persistence. I have a strong commitment to learning as well as persistence because I think we often leave out that touchstone <coughs> when we're doing our work. So. Now I'm going to just briefly mention these couple of these colleges we went to, travel colleges. <coughs> Chief Dull Life, Southeast Montana, a well, wonderful place. I only got 300 students. Coal mining, ranching. It's, it's uh, quite a place. They got a little challenge there. Three fourths of the students aren't ready in math. It's a choke point. Got it? And they've been dealing with it for 10 years. They're doing a lot of experimenting. Got a hybridized math program I'm going to talk about. So they could name a uh, help of students in two ways. Up there, we're at Glacier, where I used to work in the summer, just south of there. Metal sculptures when you come up on the campus, beautiful campus, lovely setting. And they have helping students get a foothold in college, but also helping Native American students proceed in STEM. A very fascinating company. They've got two responses, Department of Academic Success and a STEM Education Center. College of Menominee Nation, have a lot of you been up to Kashina? It's, you ought to visit, it's an extraordinary place. The air, the land, the water, as Verna Fowler, the president, talks about it. It's a wonderful place, and uh, they're doing an incredible job with STEM scholars, STEM leaders. Uh, educating students are often afraid to go and major in STEM, <coughs> right? And they're picking them up beginning when they go into high school and so on, and they create a structured pathway. A couple HSIs, they include uh, La Sierra University, one of the most diverse universities I've ever been to. Have you ever been to it? Never. Bernardino? Yeah, they've got a percentage of black, Latino, uh, white, and so on, and a Seventh-day Adventist, too, on top of everything. Extraordinary place. It just, uh, no meat, and it was a great, great uh, four days that we actually <laughs> spent there. And uh, <coughs> giving pathways, guiding very diverse students into and through the first year of college. El Paso Community College, right across from Warrens. Two initiatives there. One is the early college high school at the bottom. That's where they get students enrolled in high school. Taking college courses, learning what the hell college is about. So they don't feel like a foreigner when they go there. And then there's the college readiness program, which is a very complex algorithm, but uh, quite breathtaking in the way it kind of lifts students who are not at the same level as some other students in terms of some basic, uh, basic skills. San Diego City College, helping guide students into entry with the first year experience. Extraordinary sweet I'll mention. Uh, the H, uh, HBCUs, uh, Morehouse College, I don't know if you know there, it's in northern Atlanta, uh, uh, private HBCU, and I've been there many times. And uh, they're doing an incredible job with getting young men interested in STEM, developing an identity, as I'll talk about, providing a in this MBRS RISE program, incredible research and learning opportunities to network with other scientists around the country, build identities, many are going off to medical school, and as well as studying science, engineering, and so on. Norfolk State University, uh, I taught at William Mary a long time ago, it was just down the street, 50 miles, but uh, it's uh, uh, got this Ride and I program. Talk about a brother of cohort, cohort of first year students. And uh, they're really getting students to be in the summer bridge program at Breakfast Club moving through college. Paul Quinn College, south of Dallas, used to be 2,000 students, now 300. But they got this extraordinary, one of the most charismatic people I've ever met, next to Marion Barry, Prez, Michael Sorrell, doing this incredible job uh, with the institution. Duke Law grad came back and said, we got work to do, and he's leaving quite an input. The ethos I'll talk briefly about, we over me, you get it? We over me. I've suggested to the press that the we have me. But, uh, and finally, the three Asian American Pacific Islander Institution, College of Marshall Islands, this residential learning community, quite extraordinary, but he lives right there. These, these uh, students are often at this, it's English second language. They went to this kind of boot camp and spend uh, Two semesters, and it's a boot camp. They're up, they're up there at 6 a.m. at 6 a.m. in the morning doing exercises, study hall by 7:15, etc., etc. What a privilege it was to spend that week there. 
Cal State University, Sacramento State, a uh, pretty diverse institution. Uh, what an activist education they're getting through their full circle program. Um, North Seattle Community College, this is a wonderful place. They're doing a couple things. One is kind of complex, but I'm probably going to talk more about the nursing program because they're providing a nursing program, cohort program for non-traditional students who are enrolled <coughs> part-time. That's the big picture. Mostly what I want to talk about a little bit and be mindful of time is some of the lessons. All right? And then we're going to have this discussion. So this is what I, I think I care about. In fact, I'm, <laughs> I'm still analyzing. Can I add a lesson real quickly? Because I came up with it this morning at 6.47 a.m. <laughs> Do you analyze data even after you've read the book? Uh, yeah. Um, how much students educate peers? I, you know, I got thinking about it on made Cliff Notes. Seven of 12 programs, we have students doing peers teaching other students. And I love some of those examples, including organic cohorts, where students just come together naturally. What the institutions do, they create spaces for them to move together in cohort groups. But the, Having a math tutor who's a student instead of a professor with a measuring rod up her or his sleeve, fancy bow tie, so you get the other one. Um, so what, that's one I don't have, but I'm going to go right to lesson one. You see it up there. <coughs> these students need a foothold, these diverse students in college. Um, all that fear and uncertainty and so on. Got a lot of programs. Uh, let me mention CMN, College of Menominee Nation. They call these students in this program, and they're pleased to do so, brown eggheads. They, this STEM scholars program, they, you know, they take this cohort, they take the courses together, the three courses over eight weeks over the course of the year. They, they get this identity. They had no idea that they were talking to them, that I was going to be a STEM student, and many of them are now going on to uh, four-year institutions and, and the graduate school. <coughs> also, their early college high school, or some of the students going to early college, high school, I don't know if you know about those programs, ECHS, are actually graduating, sometimes getting two years of college before they graduate from high school. Yeah, and uh, the intermingling of university faculty with, uh, uh, with them is quite extraordinary, high school. Number two is the, uh, this one I, I like, high tech and high touch. If you've got fear and uncertainty, it can be pretty damn comfortable having a computer sometime and having a tutor and some instead of a professor standing in front of you, right? Or feeling competitive with other students. Um, you know, and, and also students are working. They're taking care of family. They've got other jobs and so on. So <coughs> this combination is really remarkable. Uh, one of my favorite examples, very quickly, is uh, <coughs> the hybrid math and pouring at uh, Chief Dunlap College. In Montana, <coughs> students take these math courses, developmental math courses, math uh, choke point, I would refer to. And uh, so what they do in the course, for example, is the instructor will walk around in the class, and uh, he uh, or she will maybe start with a mini lesson, and then students will break off sometime in an organic cohort, so it will be individually by themselves. So they're safe and supportive places, you know? and. Uh, and then having a computer where you can do it at home, it's great. Um, I'm going to turn to the third lesson. Um, this is the old guiding students into and through college. I think I've severely underestimated how much help people need. And uh, uh, first generation students and so on, little knowledge of college. <coughs> Nothing like navigators. We all need a navigator now again, right? Probably everyone in this room. And they provide them for you. They, uh, they're a diverse potpourri of seasoned students, guides, staff, and so on. They hold their hands on the front end and then say, let's go. Get self-directed by the second or third term. Uh, good example of that's uh, personal academic coaches last year at that diverse institution I mentioned, where everybody gets a coach. And the coach is a student who's helping you uh, address some of the challenges in college. Here's what it is. Here's what to think about. They're helping them with academics as well. <clears throat> In fact, the coaches who are actually BS grad, BA graduates of college um, are, are the coaches. And it's quite a commitment. 
and they end up te teaching with faculty, as I'll say in a minute. Here's the most important lesson, I think, for me. Blending roles and responsibilities. Blur traditional roles of faculty, students, staff, leaders. Lots of examples. Um, th this, uh, one of the best for me is Salish Kootenai College in Northwest Montana. They have a Department of Academic Success. Everybody comes together. They have faculty teaching there. They have tutors, um, regular tutors, math tutors, student tutors, a whole bunch of services, uh, skills workshops, cultural events. They bring people together. Faculty, staff, president comes by, everybody there. They build a community, and it's a safe place. Um, I know I observed it a lot. Um, the, uh, uh, and there's the team teaching I mentioned at La Sierra, where in some classes, uh, the coaches are teaching maybe one, 10 out of 60 minutes in a class. And they become a part of it, the kind of a, a team teaching that seemed to be working very well. Um, the other, one of the most important lessons for me is make education relevant, culturally relevant. And the best way to do it is through problem solving, or what some of us call inquiry-driven learning. In other words, you're, you're getting involved in problem solving, but the challenges that matter to their communities. A good example is uh, one of my favorites is uh, the uh, STEM program at Salish Kootenai, where students are actively involved with STEM faculty in doing research on problems relative to the reservation, near the reservation. So if there's mercury in the water and they're concerned about it, they do a study. I'll never forget this one student who you know, it was quite something, worked with a faculty member, did this study of mercury in the water. Then uh, they published it in Science, an article, in 2011. She is now a medical student at the University of Washington. I mean, they, people, the students resonate with an education that matters to their lives. And to be a part of problem solving that addresses issues, whether it's on the res or wherever it is, is something that deeply engages them. The, um, lots of other ones, the culturally, oh, I love the whole problem solving, the 65th Corridor Project at San Diego State University students are going out and uh, working, uh, tutoring with uh, young people from 7th to 12th grade, doing workshops, tutoring, and so on. They're deeply engaged in that. This one, some of you will resonate with. This is the identity issue. <coughs> But I think you know, creating a safe space where students can really explore, seize, and affirm. You know, opportunities to do that. Um, and one of the best examples of the full circle program at Sac State is just a great example of what Tim is doing there. Namely, it's it is uh, you take three courses in uh, in uh, studies, uh, Asian studies, and uh, uh, the core is about 75 students. So. They get involved in so many activities, the leadership initiative. Um, it, it is uh, uh, getting involved in the community, like the 65th Corridor Project and so on. These people are thriving, these students. They love it. They're, they have a sense of who they are, and it's, they don't, they're not doing the two-culture thing. They're creating their identity in the way that they want to create it at that institution. It's pretty inspiring. And certainly, it's great to see, like at Morehouse College, where Young men are, you know, getting this identity as, as a scientist. You know, it's incredible the percentage of students on Morehouse, black males, that go on to our graduate school. It's just off the charts. A couple more, and then we'll have a discussion. Networking. Um, this is important. I mean, people don't always get, have the opportunities that some of the rest of us do. And so to, to hear stories at Salish Kootenai or College of Nominee Nation, where students are able to go to national meetings with professors to meet people and so on. What an uplifting experience it is. It opens up eyes and uh, it makes them, uh, brings a sense of uh, what some people might call intellectual joy, for example. It's fun to see that. And uh, we saw a lot of that. Yep. Uh, uh, to just a couple more. Gather information. <coughs> I, I was never a big assessment person. <laughs> 
in many ways because I've gone out of a tenure assessment and evaluating colleges and liberal arts and everywhere else. But I must say, I've become much more data driven under the influence of Dr. Shuli Wong. <laughs> and, 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 this visit. How people take data, they collect data, they know where students are, how they're proceeding. I have the example of the nursing uh, cohort group. We actually observed some of these meetings where, where faculty, staff got together once a week and talked about how is Paul Baker doing today? They did that. Uh-huh, a little bit short. Sorry, Paul, just kidding. You get the idea. Let's, what can we do? What needs to be done here? You know, do some straight talk, tough love, and uplift people. Make sure they're on the same trajectory, and so on. So uh, I, would, I, I really am serious about that. I, I've come to appreciate how much that matters, because you're taking students one by one. Here's my favorite lesson. Whoops. Um, uh, struggled with this language for many months. Collaboration. I've, led a, I've read books and books, a lot of BS on collaboration, and it sounds a lot like cooperation to me. This language, learning with and from others, with and from others, and as we link it in the book, and in turn, giving back, it's the last, last lesson. But, uh, you know, to see this at the Marshall Islands, students, faculty, yeah, they, the faculty live up on a, <coughs> excuse me, a rock campus for the program. We were there, and I was there all night, 10, 9 to 10 at night. You see students going to faculty members' houses. They're coming up. I need a little help on this math problem. Now, I'm just curious, you know, professor from the Philippines uh, teaching there and so on. If, you know, talk about, and, and the students do that, as I earlier alluded to, to see the students learning with and from another, even as under the, the Conversations I had with students, they were doing a lot of teaching to me, uh, collaborating, learning with and from <coughs> one another. One of my, I've been to Morris five or six times, observing in the STEM pro MBR Thrive program, the PL peer led team learning, which is used elsewhere. But to see these guys, young men, you know, collaborating like that, just extraordinary. Um, they get a, get a problem, the instructor gives them, they go in their groups. They have a peer leader, somebody who's a sophomore or junior instead of a first year student. After about 45 minutes, what happens, there's a blurring of roles and responsibilities. And what you often saw was uh, the peer leader learning in the, in the first year STEM students teaching the peer leader about chemistry, or whatever the particular topic, astronomy, whatever the particular topic uh, was. So that, and, uh, that, that was. And I got to admit, at Norfolk State, a place I know pretty well to see the, the ride or die program, they got their back. I mean, it is a brotherhood. They just don't just talk it, they walk it. You know, if you aren't showing up, you're, you're showing up for class. <coughs> if you're not, you know, you, you aren't going with us on Friday night to dinner, uh, et cetera. And uh, uh, it was incredible to, to see that. One of the things I liked about the groups I want to mention, I think I said at the beginning, is they're often organic. Groups come together naturally. But what we have to do is create spaces to do that. And finally, this is the obligation to give back. I mentioned the 65th Street Quarter. This is what I love about Paul Quinn. It's me and we of giving back. It, it's just it's an amazing place. It's a community. It's the president who gets out of town. He goes, uh, drives up north to Houston because the student's going to leave college. Right? And he talks to mom and dad. Wait a sec, you've got a lot of ability here. What are you leaving? You know, what do you do? He's experimenting with things. Uh, he embodies it. Uh, and he's a good messenger, too, along with everything else. But, uh, you know, the four L's of Quinite Nation include leave the world better, lead, live a life that matters, and do something greater than yourself. They walk it. You see people doing it. They have a farm. They took the football field, made it an organic farm. They tied food to the community. They're living, they're embodying what it means to be collaborative. That, that's, you know, that kind of feeling uh, isn't going to go away. So I could mention a couple of things on this stuff, but uh, a little long. Um, of what we might learn, do you want me to say that, or is that too disruptive? To say what? 
PWIs like here might learn from? Okay, do you want those three? Okay, I'll be quick, then we'll make a conversation. One, taboo talk, can we call this? All right. Uh, the Chester's not here. Okay. Um, <laughs> traditional students face challenges as far beyond the money. Math, shame, English second language, and a whole cafeteria of other challenges. No one sets five, size fits all, what's less than one, blend roles and responsibilities. Everyone takes responsible, responsibility for uplifting students and their learning. Staff, faculty, administrators, they're all involved in it. Two, PWIs last I checked, I've only been to about 783, <laughs> but there's fierce competition. You know what I mean? It's all about me. It's fierce competition. I'm better. I'm going to beat you on that score. So, okay? It, rugged individualism, late 19th century style. Well, at these places, there's a hell of a lot of collaboration. People come together. People decide to, to work together. They realize that we live in an interdependent world. And then we can learn a hell of a lot from one another and uplift one another. And it's time we got with the program. And third is uh, students are uncertainty, uncertain about college. Let's get culturally relevant. Get them involved in that problem solving. Get them, do, do we have that here? Yeah, there was a student uh, vet yesterday doing their research. But do much, much more of that than we currently do. Uh, one last point, no, let's stop. Um, I was thinking about Madison, Wisconsin, I've been here 27 years, and uh, I mentioned blending roles and responsibilities, knocking down silos. You know, um, we do have some cake table people here on that grade. I'm thinking El Paso. El Paso, they got together nearly two decades ago, and they said, you know, only about a third of the students here in El Paso are getting out of college. We've got a job to do. They had K-12, higher ed, civic organization, government involved in the El Paso initiative. What the hell can we do? They're building, they're building for early college high schools. UTEP is on the hill. They got everybody involved. Some students go back and forth between UTEP, University of Texas El Paso, and El Paso Community College. They work together. They developed a plan for the region. I think those of us in higher ed and K-12 and so on and beyond can learn a hell of a lot from one another. And I kept, I was thinking by way of closing that maybe we need to have that kind of collaborative here in this city. I'm done. I'm sorry. <laughs>
Kevin, do you have any ideas about how to bring about change? We have Kevin Riley, the former president. You know the system. I don't have to put him on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to. I'll let others talk. I'll let others talk. What do you do? How do you stand up? You're talking about Wisconsin. Uh, Madison. I, I'm just going to focus yeah, on that for yeah. a second. So, um, you know, a group of us have been having conversations between the K 12 and, I, and, and Madison College. Right. 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 So, there's an idea that came from others about UW Madison, and that is kind of similar to the early college high schools. Right. But why not offer courses, Madison College courses, here in the evenings and weekends? Yep. And because the, the diversity of the Madison College is quite different uh, than the UW Madison campus. And as you know, the Madison campus outside of Alpha, a few other departments, don't offer courses during the evening and weekends. Yeah. So the space is available. Yeah. Madison College is closing their west campus and they're going to sell their downtown campus. And you know, this is a pipeline example. And and they think Madison College works closely with the school districts. Yeah. Perhaps a little bit more than we do. The problem there is people in Bascom view that as you know, there's a lot of legal issues and you know they come up with reasons why not to as opposed to why not uh, so it gets at so how should we bring about change yeah <laughs> when there's ideas from people outside the academy with the academy but then you get stuck well some of us didn't begin to learn how to march in 2011 Upstate Street. We began a long time ago. Uh, what are some ways to do that? To bring about change. How do you stand up? Uh, I think to begin with, you create dialogue. You hire leaders who are open to change, and not just keep things. You know, we're getting a new dean in the School of Education. I think it's a propitious time to get a dean who's going to shake things up a little bit here. Damn right, I do. Uh huh. And uh, I think a lot of leaders that have. Uh, our colleges and universities, I've met many, many of them, <laughs> like things just the way they are. And uh, so change strategies are, 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 are challenging. I like your idea. So you got the idea. It's not my idea. It's their idea. Their idea. Thank you. And uh, maybe we need to have a little protest one day. But we'll try some other things first. Thank you. Yeah, Leo? Okay. Hi. Um, I guess I'm coming from a minority perspective because I went to an HBCU for undergrad. So I appreciate your book because it gave me a much more broader perspective on not just HBCUs, but minority serving institutions as a whole. And I kind of saw the, the recurring thing between the institutions. But um, I guess one of the things that I was surprised that didn't get mentioned in the book was the like significant number of African Americans that come from HBCUs that it becomes a pipeline to institutions like UW Madison. Right. Um, and a great deal of uh, people that graduate from HBCUs go on to be judges, PhDs, and medical doctors, and things like that. So I think change does happen over time, and you know there's diversity that happens because of these institutions. But the question that I have for you uh, that relates to change is how do you see, because I know you've been involved in a lot of the civil rights, um, different decisions that have been made, particularly Fordyce versus Ayers, that deals with the integration of HBCUs and kind of trying to find, putting putting um, the responsibility on HBCUs to justify their existence. And if they can't do that, then they have to integrate or kind of change their demographics. And so there's a lot of different ways you can look at that as positive yeah. or negative. But I wanted to know what you thought about that in conjunction with the country just being more diverse and higher education having to um, accommodate that diversity. Do you have any ideas in response to my question? <laughs> I have a lot of ideas, but I ask <laughs> Are we going back to the traditional format? Uh, I don't, you know me, I don't, for once, I don't have any quick uh, thoughts on that. I, I do this civil rights thing for 35 years, and, and I've been to all these HBCUs, and I'm actually still doing it, trying to desegregate them. Um, I'm not sure the, which is the most important of the questions, of how do we I guess I would give you the background to show right. the change that HBCUs have been able to kind of enact over time, opening access for students of color, 
but I was wondering what you, how you think, basically the question is, what is the future of HBCUs based on your perspective, the involvement that you've had in the civil oh. rights um, cases? I, I think HBCUs have a, <laughs> a very, very important part in the landscape. Uh, I mean, I've been in Mississippi, Alabama, you go to Alcorn, you go out to Delta, Mississippi Valley, you go to Southern University in New Orleans, Baton Rouge, and uh, Prairie View out of Texas. Uh, um, I, they create very safe places for many students who still can't find them at other places. And uh, I, I <laughs> this sounds corny because I don't like talking about it, I just believe strongly in equal educational opportunity for all. And that's why I think that MSIs, including HBCUs, need to be continue to have a prominent place on the landscape of higher ed. Because many of our institutions have a long way to go before they can make them the kind of welcoming and supportive places. We have a lot to learn. I'm sure I do as well about creating those kind of safe places. When you hear stories, <laughs> like I've heard, <laughs> and I've heard them, uh, for many, many years, once you get out of campus, start walking around with students and say, you know, I went over to school in Missoula. Whoa, you know what they called me. I'm not going to be specific, but you get the idea. So I'm back here at a tribal college, or going to an HBC or whatever. I, I think HBCUs uh, have a place, a prominent and important place on the landscape. I think public HBCUs, as I've said to you, need to be open at the same time. I, uh, I happen to believe strongly in desegregation, and I will continue to embrace that. But I also, I think that they, uh, HBCUs ought to retain their identities as uh, historically black colleges at the same time. They're welcoming and supportive. And then I believe them very strongly. Yeah. Oh, is that it? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. With the budget cuts, a lot of MSI have opened the door to international students. So a lot of them uh, will be working with international students from Asia and Africa and other places. So how this MSI can retain the primary mission and open the door to uh, international students? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the last part. So how does MSI can open the door to international students and maintain their primary mission? Well, you know, you've been in global studies. Think about that. Um, what do you think? I bet you've got an idea. <laughs> oh, no, we do that again. Well, I'll just think about that question. The international students. I, I think there's some comparisons, yeah. I think it creates safe places, among other things where people begin to feel more welcome. And uh, uh, Julie and I, we have people over to our house, you know, and uh, try to create that kind of, a, kind of a place where people can feel comfortable, uh, get to know one another, and we can begin to break down some of those barriers. I, I, think, I think, this sounds really corny, but you know, I like going to places where people actually say hello once in a while. Now, you people here, most of you say hello. <laughs> Kevin, Kevin says hello. He even says, huh, I see you published a book. <laughs> it's called Noticing One Another. Do you get the algorithm? I, I think sometimes in larger institutions they do this, but simple creating a, a sense of belonging on campus, even if you have to be a little goofy once in a while, to do that. We do a risk taking. Say, how do you do it? Well, I like your tie. You know, I wear this damn tie across campus. Whoa. All of a sudden, people are noticing me for a change. <laughs> Except for a certain group of people. <laughs> are we still on film? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead and make the comment. You don't feel like you need to thank you. Need to, I need to ask you. I'm asking for your ideas, too. We've got a lot of diversity in the room of all kinds. Yeah. I think your last statement uh, was something that could have been answered, I guess, in the first question about how can PWI, what can they kind of take from the minority survey institutions. I think it's also interesting, what if PWIs typically, they just don't want to have that environment. They're not saying it explicitly, 
saying that they want to be open and welcoming. And uh, I think from your travels across the country, have you, I mean, did you get a sense of how upper level administration, how they're buying in within this intake, or was it kind of student driven? I think, uh, you know, I've got to be careful here. I, can I speak really? Okay. Um, I think, you know, we talked about the concept of campus climate. Mm -hmm. Drives me crazy. We don't have one climate here. We got a trillion different climates. It depends on the day, it depends on the people, it depends on the setting. Okay. Some climates like this one can feel pretty supportive. You know, people are listening, talking to one another. I think sometimes we worry more, and I'm not talking about here, but in general, about these campus-wide diversity problem challenges on the map, instead of getting real about what do we do across the campus? What do we do to blend roles and responsibility? What should the director of WC ERB be doing? You know, do I have lots of suggestions? You damn right I do. <laughs> Including a chancellor and so on, people who walk around the campus once in a while. Say hello, what are you doing? What are you studying here? Hey, you studying homeless? Well, that's interesting. What'd you learn? You know, and uh, that kind of uh, conversation. I'm not talking just talking about the showpiece. I know about that. I talked to the next I know a lot of them. Paul Flynn, college, friends wants it. He goes around. He sees people. I live there for over 300, 40,000 students with a severe budget crisis. I understand that. But yeah, that creating that kind of uh, in our respective settings where there's a climate of trust and support. And, you know, um, I'm even, to take an example, in my DSA University class, I'm learning, new, I'm using the learning new W. <laughs> and it is just fascinating now that the folks are really good today, too. And, you know, to hear, to, to see students dialoguing with one another. Uh, I like your point, Kim, but you know, so you're, you're getting people involved in it. So there are different ways I think we can do it, and I didn't appreciate until this term, excuse me, how online learning can be a safe place for students to speak freely. And all of a sudden they're saying, what the hell did Cliff say in that last class assignment? <laughs> <laughs> right? You know, and uh, creating that kind of a space. And uh, I think we need a lot more of that. Your ideas. Uh, my question. I got a burning question. Enough of me. Yes, Kevin. So back to your original question about you know, how do you create a change. So I, yeah. you know, one of the ways to do that is by clearing out some things that might be preventing and disrupting positive change. So one of the striking things, still unfortunately, about what you put up in front of us today is that the completion rates yeah. at these colleges are yeah. very poor. Right. I think the people who go on very often do very well, but vast majority of students who started these colleges are not getting the degree or certificate they come for. What, what did you learn, if anything, about things that have been tried there that people would say to you, well, we tried this, but it didn't? Are what? we doing some of the things that don't work that we should oh. figure out? I have to think about that. That's a wonderful, very question, Kevin. What have they tried that doesn't work? I'm trying to think of some things that are used as PWIs. That, uh, that they use. Um, I think um, just fancy dinners. Oh, I know one. We have, it's going to hurt. We have speakers come in all the time and just splatter the whole time. You get it, right? You know, uh, dinners, fancy dinners, where sometimes students often feel very uncomfortable. They like more of an informal setting, right, Julia? They like to, they like to, to hang out, be comfortable with the place. You know? See somebody playing catch with their grandchild. Whatever the hell it is. You get it. I think I think uh, I think we have a very formulaic approach to it. And and, and I do think the one on one is important. And so people are saying, asking, where are you coming from? You know? But you make it a two way deal. It's about me and you. Right, Harvey? Yeah. You make it a two way deal. Um, I, in your book, I read that you talked a little bit about culture and the influence that the kind of background that these students have in their outcomes. I think it's really critical to talk about that explicitly to understand why they have the outcomes that they have. And so I was wondering, um, when you talk about like 
the Asian um, students, and when you talk about the Hispanic students, you talk about them being immigrants, yep. how that impacted their um, experience in, in college. I was wondering what you saw in terms of African American students and um, Native American students, or just the differences in the types of history and how that influenced students' outcomes, um, and also what role did discipline play? Because that word sure. came up, discipline. discipline. That word came up about 15 times, and I was probably more. And so I was yeah. wondering, like, yeah, the book came up. Yeah, I was wondering what kind of just the if you so there's there's two things really them being immigrants and then being voluntary versus involuntary immigrants and how that impacted their outcomes. Oh. Did you observe that? And I have to think about the latter. That's an interesting question on the parsing between voluntary and I wouldn't want to get a deeper answer. No. Um, I do think one of the fascinating things for me is uh, self-discipline um, uh, is a challenge for many students and it, that cuts across um, many racial, ethnic, and income groups, low income groups. Um, so that a lot of programs did have self-discipline built in, but they also created those those cohorts where people, you know, brotherhood like the you know, house or like diet uh, or diet at uh, Norfolk State, where people had each other's backs and they said, get it up. Like I said earlier, you got to show up for dinner. Come on, you have to get that work done. How's math going? And uh, um, I think sometimes on the self discipline, it was always fascinating that they let the students do that to one another. Does that make any sense? Where they, it wasn't the hierarchical approach that we've often seen in this country. It was uh, students help one another become more self uh, disciplined. So, like at the College of Marshall, I'm getting up at 6 o'clock, and, and kind of a tough love approach. Um, but I've also, when faculty and administrators and staff love students, then they can be tough on them, too. I think you got to have the love a little bit on the front end, so they trust you. And then you, then you, then you get that kind of straight talk. The book, by the way, has many, many narratives and quotes. I like quotes and stories of individual students that really give life. I was looking at my notes for the uh, <coughs> Chief Bill went to college and how vibrant some of those quotes are about, for example, what, how I learned to become more self-disciplined as a result of that boot camp up at the uh, Iraq campus of California. Sorry, I didn't really articulate this from the part trying to understand in the narrative what were the differences that you observed between the students being having voluntary or involuntary Yeah. Because they that, talked about that. I, have a, I need to think about that. I, that's a great question. I don't have a quick answer. I don't. I don't think I thought about it that way. And uh, um, <laughs> so, sorry. I'll think about it. It's a good question. Am I still analyzing these data? OK. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, I actually, my undergrad is one of my graduate years, the amount of times when I heard my students say that you know, you're extremely diverse and that this is the most diverse climate they've ever experienced. In, it's, I'm not from the continent, it's very shocking to me. Oh, I'm in the same place with you. I'm new here. As yeah, so, so just in general. I mean, the majority of the undergrads truly believe that this is like, this is like diverse. And it's, it's not. And, and I don't know, maybe that's yeah. like, even yeah. Chicago, like a lot of them. <laughs> A lot of freshmen, sophomore, they've never been to Chicago. It's only three hours away. They just, they don't know. I think that's an interesting comment that you made. I think. We know that students make those comments to the um, faculty, staff, and administrators, and we know that this is not a very diverse place. So what are we saying to the students that we are working with, that are in our classes, that are in our programs? Are we just letting them say, oh, this is a diverse place, or are we engaging them in that type of conversation? And I don't, I don't know how, like I said, I'm kind of new, new here about two months, but I don't know what type of those conversations we are engaging in. Because I've heard that comment with a few students since I've been here. And I was like, OK, so let's talk about that. So what do you mean by diverse? Um, and I think that's how we start planting those seeds. But I'm not sure, is this yeah. a place that we would like to do that are all faculty members comfortable having those conversations? I think a lot are. I think, I mean, just the amount of like, diversity committees there are across campus, individual schools, individual students. Um, we have so 
many options. I just don't I just don't think this community are really understanding or utilizing them. And if we're supposed to help them, we're supposed to help kids 